Hello, we are the Edgy Futurists. I'm Dan Fitzpatrick. I'm Ben Whitaker. And I'm Stephen Hope. The podcast by educators for educators. The Edgy Futurist Hello, Podcast. We are the Edgy Futurists. I'm Dan Fitzpatrick. I'm okay, Whitaker, and Stephen welcome Hope. to the podcast. The podcast. Uh, my name is Dan Fitzpatrick. Uh, we've got Steve, Ben, and we're joined by Bob Harrison as well, joining us today on the podcast. Uh, it's great to have Bob, a legend in the UK when it comes to education. He's here to discuss with us the past, the present, and the, we'll be exploring the future as well of education in light of the COVID-19 pandemic. If you're listening right now live, we are, we are live broadcasting on YouTube and on Twitter. Welcome. It's great to have you with us. Um, if you've got any questions, you can leave them in the comments and we'll try and get them to Bob during the episode. We've also got Transform online learning video series featuring Google Jamboard, uh, Google Meet and Google Classroom with our friends um, at BenQ. Um, we've also got the hashtag Home School Heroes, celebrating and sharing our teachers and parents uh, and help each other during this time of the pandemic. Yeah, so go out and check out our uh, podcast at www.edufuturist.com. Like and subscribe to our YouTube channel, uh, Edgy Futurist. Uh, we'd love to get you involved in some of that. So as we said, uh, we're absolutely amazing. So glad to be joined by Bob Harrison today. Um, it was an extensive experience in schools and colleges as a teacher, a lecturer, a senior manager, a principal and a governor. Uh, he's worked with head teachers and senior leaders in developing leadership skills for the National Colleges of Schools Leadership uh, and was advised uh, an advisor to DFES on the FE principal's qualification, was a digital e-learning advisor for the uh, for the Strat standards unit and was a lead on digital futures for the building schools for the future leadership program where he designed and delivered the program at national level for several local authorities. Yeah, Bob is a board member of the UFI Trust, a £60 million charity supporting innovative development in the use of technology for teaching, learning and assessment in further vocational and adult education. He's a judge for multiple awards, including Better Awards, TES, FE Awards, uh, Learning Remain. And um, he has been involved in the EdTech UK Awards too. Yeah, uh, Bob was recently shortlisted for the TES FE Lifetime Achievement Award for services to further vocational and adult education. And you can follow Bob on Twitter at Bob Harrison EDU. The podcast by educators for educators, the Edu Futurist Podcast. <clears throat> well, hello, Bob. Um, I think we go back way back when, and we've been wanting to get you on the podcast. And uh, the first, you are the first guest to be on the live stream. So uh, hopefully, you're feeling good about it. Well, I, I am feeling good about it. And can I just say thanks for the introduction, uh, Dan and Stephen and Hope and Ben. Uh, I, I just like to say I might feel the oldest, but Ben at least proves I'm not the baldest. Of, uh, <laughs> 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 I've, I've got my head on upside down though bob that's my problem <laughs> it was it was always, it was always yeah. difficult telling those jokes bob when we were a podcast and we never used to have the video so i'm glad that we're uh we're yeah, now exactly. coming to the forefront exactly. on youtube and twitter so i think steve's got enough hair on his face for everyone to be fair yeah very true. <laughs> i used to glue it on per well, episode I, so. I, and so so you don't break any uh safeguarding rules i've promised i'll keep me I'll, I'll watch my language, uh, which is not, as you know, because you've heard me present, is not normally. When I get passionate and riled up about things, that, but I, I, I'm, I'm in control. Don't worry, boys. But we want you to be passionate, Bob, and that's why we've brought you on. I think there's so many people um, intrigued on YouTube and Twitter right now. To um, The first question is, how are you coping with a lockdown? Is it any different for you? Uh, uh, it, it, it's, yeah, it is, it is difficult and I at a very, very personal level. Uh, I mean, it's a, it's a bit of a sad day for me today because you're far too young to uh, know. Uh, there's a, a, a famous American singer-songwriter called John Prine, and sadly he passed away last night because of COVID. Um, so the, the background music today is always, has always been John Prine all the way through the day. Uh, the thing I'm finding most difficult at all, not about uh, communicating, because, in fact, funnily enough, you know, I've been able to write an article for what should be out in the TES uh, FE in the next two or three days about uh, COVID and how to cope and everything like that. Uh, but the most difficult thing is from a personal point of view, I've got seven grandchildren. I've got five five children with two families and I've got seven grandchildren. And just not seeing them and holding them, hugging them and spending time with them, that's that's been the most difficult. In terms of 
the, the bits of stuff I do now, you know, I tend to work from my armchair more than anything because I can do all the judging. I mean, for example, on Friday this week, uh, and I think they're watching today, the e-assessment people, great organisation, been pushing the e-assessment uh, against the odds, against Ofqual and against DFE for some time. And I was the judge for their awards. And we did it all online. You know, we had loads of entries and we shortlisted and then we interviewed the people online. And it, it's quite possible, and you and I all know this, that it has been, it's quite possible for some of the work that we do as educators to be delivered online but you know maybe maybe not all of it and that's that's one of the one of the the, the big challenges i think that people face and i think just just before we start talking about the present and the future just 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 let me take you back a little bit and why i think it's so frustrating and so difficult and so challenging for a lot of schools and colleges is because the design principles upon which our education system is predicated come out of an era uh, of heavily dominated by certain industries. You know, it's the turn of the century, revolution, uh, steel, coal, textiles, manufacturing, uh, uh, shipbuilding, and all those industries have a mechanical sort of process orientated thing. If you think about our schools and colleges, they're built, People attend first thing in the morning, they go into little boxes, they do things, uh, they reflect on them, uh, they, they have, then they go to the next subject and then a bell rings. And, and that's a very mechanical and industrial process. I, I'll be honest with you, and you've heard me say this for some time now, I, I, I'm not sure it's that design, delivery, support, inspection, process, assessment, on predicated on those principles I think it's under massive strain and is no longer really fit for purpose. Yeah, I couldn't agree yeah. more, Bob. Totally couldn't yeah. agree more. And um, I know that you've been really, really um, vocal for a long time about the way that things have been and the, the systems that they're built upon. Um, I remember the first time I heard you actually talked about um, being knee deep in certain, certain, uh, Material. Mm, mm. I don't know if you could talk to us about mm. that because I think that's that's the whole premise that you're talking about, isn't it? Well, it, yeah. It, I mean, it's, it's if we, we could have got the slide, couldn't we? And basically, the premise is Ben uh, that I, I don't think, and I think this is really important about when we start talking about post COVID nineteen because there's, there's absolutely no doubt about it. Jo jokingly, we were saying, you know, Tom Bennett's been a bit, bit quiet. Nick Gibbs been a bit quiet. Uh, Mark Lehane's been a bit quiet. You know, all those people who've been slagging off technology uh, all of a sudden have retreated into their little holes. But let me tell you this, they'll be planning on how to take control back again afterwards. And so we, we have to be really on our ball to make sure that we don't let that happen. And I think the metaphor that you're talking about, the one that I use is, uh, and it's true, um, and if people want to Google it uh, whilst we're talking, just Google uh, London horse manure crisis, 1890. And, and basically the, the problem was because of the Industrial Revolution, the population of London and Birmingham and Manchester and Glasgow was going to increase by something like 300%. And because the horse-drawn carriages were the main form of transport, or horses themselves, the, cal the town planners calculated that all those people were coming into those city centres in between 7 o'clock and 9 o'clock in the morning then the roads would be, you know, six feet deep in horse shit. And so, uh, I'm sorry if that offends people, but I can't say it any other way, horse poo. Uh, and so their way of dealing with it, because at the time they didn't know any better, their, their paradigm, their mindset, and this is the key point about thinking and paradigm, it's not, this is not really about technology, guys. This is about ways of thinking. And their thinking of the town planners was right. We need to get rid of this horse shit because otherwise people won't be able to get into work and the businesses will collapse and then the whole economy is gone. So they decided that, that they would have to build horse shit big containers at the corner of every road junction so that they could employ a, a, a whole range, that 10,000 uh, young people to go and shovel the shit out of the road into the skips so that people could get through. And they were about to sign off on this order when the paradigm shift 
was Henry Ford driving around the corner in his car. And I think what the difficulty we've got now is we've got Henry Ford driving around the corner in the car, and we've known that for some time. We've known the potential of the car, haven't we, if we're extending this metaphor. We've known of the potential of digital technology to engage more learners, to enhance and improve learning. We were uh, also uh, you know, aware of uh, uh, how it can uh, improve and empower learners. We, we, know, we know all that. So we know the, whole, the car's there. What I'm afraid of is that we will want to lash it to the back of a horse. And it just doesn't make any sense. So what we've got to what we've got to guard against now is trying to force trying to force our new technology into old ways of working because it, it won't that that won't happen and that will give the Tom Bennett's of the world and the Mark Lehanes and the Nick Gibbs and the Daisy Christol do they'll that gives them the ammunition to say see we told you it didn't work well it won't work if you try and force it into or an old paradigm of pedagogy, and that's why uh, that's why I think uh, the, the the current DFE ed tech strategy is so fundamentally flawed. Never mind the the paltry ten million pounds that's given it. Ten million pounds. They give they gave fifty million pounds to expand grammar schools. Ten million pounds for the whole of the ed tech strategy. But it's predicated, it's chucking money, good money after bad, because it's predicated on a flawed premise. And the flawed premise is uh, that you can have a, a twin drivers of a strategy. One that comes from business. In other words, let's promote Microsoft and Apple and Google and all those good people doing good stuff. And at the same time, let's 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 get teachers to do. It. You, you can't do both of those things. It either has to be led by pedagogy and teachers and educators or it's meaningless because I've, I've lived with teachers most of my life I've worked with them uh, I've got kids who are teachers I've trained hundreds and hundreds of them and I've led them and teachers will you can get a great deal out of teachers if you do things with them but if you start doing things to them then it's not going to work so I think we've got to shift from it being product and services led to being pedagogically led and that means we don't start trying to force new technology into old ways of working yeah just to, just going back to what you said about the the manure and that um that whole analogy for today i'll just put a, a comment up from dave leonard there who's who's reiterating what you said there bob it it just it just brings to mind that you know the, the samar model of of adopting ed tech and i think a lot of a lot of institutions, a lot of schools, a lot of colleges are kind of are at the substitution level at the moment, aren't they, in terms of, well, let's just take what we were doing in lesson and stick it in a Google mm. Meet or in a Zoom mm. call. Mm. And you can say that. Mm. I don't know if you follow the, the uncommon schools and the Teach Like a Champion stuff from America. Yeah. Yeah. A, lot, yeah. a lot of them are doing yeah. that at the moment. They're just taking what the strategies that they had and they, they're putting it on a video call. Um, I, I guess my question is, is that is that an essential first step before we get onto the the augmentation and the and the other le the other levels of that SAMR model? Um, do you think it's it's necessary to do that first? Uh, well, I think a lot of people are at that. I mean, you, you talk about the SAMR model. The, the the five E model is the one that I use in the presentations, which right. is what we used at the National College for School Leadership. And again, I wish I'd had my slides. I could get them up for you. But that's it's the same. The bottom line there is, and the question I use when I'm working with schools and colleges in conferences and workshops is to say, the first thing is to look at what you're existing. What, what are you actually doing? What are you using technology? And if you're just using an interactive whiteboard and you say, right, we're using technology, I would suggest your men, which is all you're doing is exchanging an electronic version of a chalkboard. Uh, uh, yeah. On the other hand, on the other hand, so so we've got exchange at the bottom end, and then we've got enhance and extend. We've got empower, and that means if you've got students that, as well as the work that you're doing, they're also signing up for a Stanford or an MIT MOOC, or they're on Future Learn, or they're sharing in a, 
uh, a network of people that are addressing the particular issue and i think i think that's that's the opportunity we've got now because lots of young people with 19 are empowered are starting to use the technology but like you say you, you, we all know that slapping a few notes on a powerpoint or uh, having a, an odd zoom session that that that's that you, you just really at that bottom end of the extend but nevertheless it's a good it's a really good start you'd have to be doing something uh, but we need to i think you do need to go through some of those learning stages before you get to to, to the, the the real powerful stuff which is about uh, are we getting students using their own technology in their own time in addition to what they're doing in schools and colleges to access learning and assessment and once we've once we got up to that then i think you're really talking business aren't you but that that, that doesn't sit easily if you look at the dfe ed tech strategy do a google word search on it and you won't find the word learning now that tells you something about the mindset of of the politicians that and, and the ed tech strategy talks about teaching and efficiency gains well, if, if you set off with that, that's your particular focus, that's your aim, that's your point, you're missing the, you're missing the point, to be honest with you. And, and, and it is moving on a little bit from the um, talk about other strategies and other things that's come out, Bob, and I know it's about looking forward and, and we'll, we will move on to the present and obviously the future as well, but you were involved in Feltag many many years ago and obviously then moved on to e-tag and everything else is there anything still relevant in there and i know jamie brought up a question is it, is it time for fell tag 2.0 or potentially 5.0 or wh whatever connotation we're looking at what what is relevant now and actually how can we build on that well I, I, absolutely well I, before i get onto fell tag and i will cover fell tag but but also for the school people that are listening as well uh, at least Feltag saw the, 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 the light of day and, and wh whatever you think about Matt Hancock's politics and personally I, I hate him with a passion but that, uh, and whatever you think about him in his current role I have to say uh, he was the only one uh, you know I've, I've, I've worked under about 35 ministers of FE in my time because I'm as you know I'm 70 now and uh, he, he was one of the very few that listened and got it he understood he understood the potential of technology and funnily enough in his health role he's uh, he's pushing the technology one as well put the politics to one side but before feltag I, I want to take you back to another one that i was involved in when i was still with toshiba and this was 2008 and, and in fact i've just i've tweeted about it just recently and posted it on um, jim knight who's now lord jim knight was a minister schools minister under the last labor government uh, under Ed Balls. Ed Balls was the Secretary of State and Jim Knight. And Jim came to us at Toshiba and uh, he said, listen, I've got this idea. I'm worried that uh, there are lots of children in disadvantaged homes on free school meals, pu you know, what pupil premium we've got now. And uh, I'm really worried they're missing out because, you know, all the middle class kids and the kids who've got plenty of resources and now schools are pouring more and more stuff online. I'm really worried that uh, if they haven't got access to a device or connectivity at home, they're going to get left behind. And the, the, the gap between, um, you know, the achievement gap will widen. And so we signed up to it, Toshiba and a few other providers, and I sat on the advisory board, and it was called the Home Access to Technology Initiative. Now, before we talk about Feltag 2.0, we need a Home Access to Technology 2.0 or covid you know, whatever you want to call it, because all these kids at home now, if you're, you know, living in a block of flats that there's no Wi-Fi or, you know, there's four or five of you, you know what I'm saying, and you haven't got access to connectivity and there's no broadband, you're at a significant disadvantage. Now, the really sad thing about the Home Access to Technology Initiative was uh, it, it was towards the end of the Labour government, if you remember, they, they lost in, and I'm not going to get political about it, but they left in 2010 when we had the Building Schools for the Future program as well, which had a 4.5 billion, not million, 4.5 billion budget for ICT in the new schools that we're going to build. Michael Gove came into power. The first two things he pulled were BSF and the Home Access to Technology. Now, I, 
Jim Nye, and we, the, the, the uh, final evaluation report of the home access to technology, it was 300 million pounds and devices and connectivity was given to kids on free school meals in certain pilot areas. And the evaluation report, and it's up on Twitter, you know, if you search for it on Google, uh, home access to technology, a final evaluation report, it demonstrated that if you improve connectivity and you improve access and you give them a device and they can access the resources, then the achievement gap closed and their, their, their results improved. So I think before we even start talking about felt tag or e tag and what schools and everything need to do, the first thing that we need to do is to revisit that concept and and see how we can make that use now. In in this, you know, quickly, quickly, because I don't know about you, but I can't see schools going back before September. And the the longer schools are off, the more middle class parents and people who've got access to devices. You know, there are some homes where there's multiple devices, multiple screens, super fast broadband, da, 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 da. and then there are lots of homes where there's none of that. So that's the first thing. Going on to Feltag, I, I don't think you even need to call it Feltag 2.0. Let, let me just remind you what the key recommendations were. There were six. The first of all was, Colleges and providers, and I think it goes for schools as well. It doesn't have to be further education. Do they have a vision of what learning looks like and assessment with the potential of the te digital technologies that we've got now and that are coming down the line? Do we have leadership? Do we have governors and head teachers and principals who have the vision and the time to see what's coming over the horizon and therefore make plans accordingly for that? That's the first thing. The second thing is, do we have the sufficient robust and rigorous infrastructure? Do we have, you know, Wi-Fi? Do we have super fast broadband? Do we have uh, internal devices? Do we have the technical support? Uh, that means teachers won't be frightened to try things and innovate for fear of it falling over and then them being stuck in front of a 30 odd class of kids on a Friday afternoon, you know, who, who are rioting. The third one is. To what extent are we tapping into the learner's experience with technology and their own devices? So if, if what comes out of this COVID-19 is the government just thinks what we need to do, is throw a load of money and a load of technology at it, wrong. That's absolutely not the thing to do. And if you, if you want proof of that, another bit of Google experience for you. Google, Apple. Los Angeles, iPad, disaster. Throwing technology at, at, at it will not work. What we need to do, and this moves me on to the, the fourth thing, as well as learners using their own technology and their own experience, and this is probably the most important thing, is do we have the workforce? Do we have the workforce that has the capacity, the capability, the confidence, and the ability to share with each other with their experience in digital use of technology for digital learning uh, uh, assessment online blended virtual do we have the current workforce and if we don't what do we need to do to create that so th those were the top four there were two more one is particularly fa based which is do colleges and providers are they do they have a sufficiently close relationship the, the employers that they're trying to prepare young people to go and work in. So is there a synergy between what employers technology is using and what the colleges uh, are using? So, for example, if, if you've got a college that's entirely Apple based and using Apple iOS, are they or are you sure they're going to be going working into workplaces that are all going to be using Apple? I don't think that is I don't think they are, are they? And the uh, and the final one, which I think is the real crux. And this is the most frustrating thing about both Feltag and ETAG. I, I tell you, the minister accepted the Feltag recommendations within a few hours and he published the government's response and accepted them. But the most obstructive and difficult organisations that made it very, very difficult and in fact impeded it significantly. It wasn't the teachers, wasn't the colleges, wasn't the governors, wasn't the principals, wasn't the techies. It was Ofqual, Ofsted and the funding agency. Ofqual, 
uh, wouldn't have anything to do with it. The, the recommendation for them was that they should look at whether their current assessment systems were getting the best of the technology. They didn't even bother to respond. Off, Ofsted were asked to change the common inspection framework to include a criteria that would say when they were in there inspecting, could they comment on uh, innovative use of technology and how schools and colleges were using technology effectively? They refused point blank to do that. Uh, what they said was uh, they would uh, train their inspectors up to appreciate and understand uh, uh, how technology was being used. Now, Stephen Hope will remember at the inspection that we had at Leeds City College when I was working for Pete Roberts, the, in the inspector that came, I was absolutely clueless about the use of technology. In fact, she said she preferred writing on a A4 pen and paper uh, and she was just grappling with this thing called email. So, uh, and, and to, to my mind, that I don't think now, even now, all these years later, Ofsted have, have, have actually trained their inspectors. And the final one, and this is the crunch. The, the English, the schools funding agency and the school, the funding agency, they were asked to examine their funding agency and asked to reflect on whether they thought it actually encouraged innovation with the use of technology or it impeded it. After two years, they still hadn't responded. And eventually they did some research. They paid an outside organization and they, they paid them a significant amount of money and they came up with these three recommendations. First of all, online learning is very complex. Secondly, there didn't seem to be much of a call for it from the sector. <laughs> and thirdly, thirdly, because we're a funding agency, it's none of our business. So, no matter how much you try, we try, I can go around and inspire as, as best I can teachers on the ground or on Twitter, support them or, you know, do things like this to promote them. It, it, the claustrophobic nature of the control mechanisms of our sector, schools and colleges, make it very, very difficult. I think COVID-19 is about to change all that. I think I'm with. I think we're with you. Um, we're hoping. We're hoping it is as well. And we know that this is a it's a disaster, just like the stuff you were talking about with your grandkids and 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 not being able to see them. And we know that there's there's lots of people that are really suffering through this time. From a teaching point of view and from an education point of view, how we how we make something positive from this is uh, is kind of going to be the lasting part of our legacy, I think. Um, and I, I'm yeah. I'm really excited to see what is. What is what is happening around the world? We're seeing loads of collaboration happening, loads of sharing, and in fact, we've got Jim Knight. He's agreed to come on uh, the podcast in a couple of weeks' time, which is really exciting. Um, so, looking forward to doing that one. But that whole idea about equitable access, um, and that's not a, that's not a socialist position. That's not a political position. That is a that is a human rights um, uh, equality position. It's a it's about. Um, just because you were in a certain postcode or just because you're in a certain school or because you've got parents have got certain jobs, that's no reason why you should get uh, preferential treatment. And uh, we, we're we really we're really big on, on the equitable access. We've had loads of guests on over the past, Shay and Batista and um, some of the others that talk about equity. Um, and and I, I'm really hearing that in what you're talking about, Bob, that the whole nature of the, the Feltag stuff and the and the, then the stuff that we've with Jim Knight prior to that as well it, it, it just screams at that concept of we should be the, there's a there's an ethical and a moral obligation on us as educators and people mm. people with uh, the finances and ultimately the thing is what's funny about the league tables thing and the conversation about the suspension of all of that what that means um uh, and, and what value that puts on the exams and, and leg tables anyway. Uh, it just makes me think we've got a real opportunity here to do something and do something that has real difference. And just to jump in there, Ben, as well, like one of the United Nations human rights is education. And we, there's, a, there's, a, there's a percentage of the, the population now who aren't receiving a decent education because they don't have that access. And I know somebody in the comment stream before mentioned how um, there's now the possibility that councils are going to be sued because of this as well. Yeah, I think, I think uh, uh, technology, 
I once I once heard Michael uh, Fullan speak about school improvement and and performance and achievement, and and he said that you know Michael Fullan, the Canadian education and everything like that, and uh, quite influential. And he said something like, "I'm going to talk to you about school improvement and how you improve pupils' performance and everything like that." Uh, I'm not going to say anything about technology because. Everything I say is accelerated by technology. And I think technology can either be an accelerant and a positive differentiator, or it can be a negative and discriminator against those. And it's up to us as educators to make sure that everybody gets an even playing field. And at, at this moment in time, I think the uh, well, I think the whole school, the whole league tables things have gone for two years now, haven't they? You know, Pisa, all that. It's got it's going to be meaningless because of the data and everything like that. So, but I, I have a real fear that in this, unless we do something radical and drastic and increase the capacity, have a better vision, get a better skilled workforce, strengthen the uh, robustness of the uh, infrastructure. And stop and push back against Ofqual and Ofsted and the Skills Funding Agency and the DFE and say, no, listen, you know, this is what we're going to do because this is what's best for kids. And if that does, if that doesn't mean what your rules, are, then, then I'm sorry, that's the way that it is. Because I'm going to do what's best for kids. Yeah, I, I think I mentioned it to yourself, Bob, and I think I've said it on a podcast previously. I think um, it seems like. Uh, Mr. Williamson has uh, been good to his word when he said about the quiet corridors and the ban of mobile phones in schools. Um, little did he know that actually um, the mobile phones would be used at home by kids and the schools would be quiet due, during this pandemic and actually the sh learning has shifted actually to where it needs to be. I think that whole ethos, I think he now needs to go back and revisit it, if I'm honest, and say, right, what are we looking at? We're looking at learning here. Learning happens when conversations and collaborations happen and mobile phones are a powerful tool that students have. Let's look at not necessarily the problems that can be caused. Let's look at the strength. And when there's a lack of funding in schools, how can we then look at those tools, the power that we already have in, in kids' hands and, and everything else and the amount of money that we have that kids could utilise for technology rather than investment from the schools that are struggling and let's, powerful, let's, let's make that powerful. Let's focus on learning. And, and another thing is, Let's focus on learning here. Let's not focus on tech in. Let's let's not no, talk about a new no. digital strategy. Let's focus on a teaching and learning strategy that is as a as a, a strand littered deep within it of a core of how technology can enhance, engage, extend learning beyond the classroom, improve assessment, efficiency of the staff, and all of the different things and look at the positive. And I think let's try and get behind it and push for the fact that he needs to revisit that because and admit that he was wrong. That mobile phones without uh, that uh, now, without mobile phones, absolutely. where would we be during this current climate? Uh, absolutely, and and, and you, you you spent you, you work in further education, and so did I. And I understand my moles in the DFE tell me that the new she's not not FE and skills minister, apprentices and skills minister, but FE comes under her brief uh, is very pro. Uh, online blended virtual tech so there's some hope because if you think about it uh, I, I go back the, the first first computers I ever used at uh, Stannington College which is now part of Sheffield College way way back in the early 1980s with uh, have you ever taught motor vehicle students Steve I um, I've, I haven't taught them but I've been in and I've, I've done a few observations and, and I've been around them well mo I, I because I was a general studies teacher, uh, I used to get motor vehicle five. So that was the 21 year olds. They were just coming out of their apprenticeships on a Friday afternoon for general and communication studies, mainly because the motor vehicle department had all buggered off on their uh, weekends in their caravans. And uh, fortunately for me, the business department who had the two rooms of BBC microcomputers. You remember those BBC microcomputers? They, they, they were also vacant on Friday afternoon because the business studies had pissed off on in their caravans as well. Maybe they were having a get together. So motor vehicle five on a Friday afternoon, two till four general studies. Pong, pong saved my life. 
because I used to take those lads up into the, uh, the one room of BBC computers. There were 16 in the class. And we learned some very, very basic. You can imagine how basic it was. And I taught them how to make their own video games. You know, very little simple crisscross, ping pong, and everything like that. Now, those that, that's 20 odd years ago, 30 odd years. Oh, Christ, it's 30 odd years ago. Uh, those lads now, well, the, or the replacement lads, walk around the Lexus and the Mercedes garages in white coats with more power in their pockets in a mobile phone than in those two rooms of BBC micros combined more power more facilities taking photos recordings and most importantly most importantly access to the world of knowledge because they had internet has our pedagogy moved on has our pedagogy moved on nowhere near as much no and, and I think it's that whole approach of um, and I know it's it, some education organisations are, are shackled by funding and everything else, and this is not a criticism, but I think we need to look at the an evaluation of actually what our learning spaces look like. Is it the fact that learning can happen anywhere and, and, and the flexible learning spaces and actually how we then can extend that beyond the four walls of a classroom into spaces in a building and then four walls and outside of a college building is massive. We haven't looked at what used to be the flipped approach we we haven't spent enough time and how can we then develop those so students are developing those skills within the college building so not another pandemic but when so they can extend and have the understanding and the skills to do this understand it can be critical thinking and, and be creative embedded into curriculum and and focus not just on the, the content and and what they need for an exam the whole holistic approach to to developing le learners is vital as well well, that, that, that reinforces my, my point about trying to force new technology into old ways of working. And this is what's fundamentally wrong with the DFE Ed Tech strategy. Tr trying to force things into classrooms. Why do people keep how we use technology in classrooms? The, the, the most powerful bit of technology is its ability to be able to use outside the classrooms and outside the classroom time. And just on the, thing, the issue about resources, I know it's a tricky one. And listen, I'm chair of governors. I, I, I fully know how the budget cuts have affected us over the last 10 years. It's been it's been ridiculous. And now all of a sudden, oh, yeah, well, you know, quickly get on to online. Learning. And how cheeky is this? We had a, we had guidance and a letter from the skills funding agency yesterday, day before, uh, saying they're not going to claw back any money uh, this year from our funding because all oh, the students are not there and everything like that. However, unless we can demonstrate that we've moved stuff to online delivery, they may claw back. So for 10 years, they've not wanted to fund online delivery. And now they're saying, if you take our money back, but let me, let me just say this about resources and you will remember very well, Peter Roberts and Leeds city college, 400 people, uh, in a, in a, a Edinley when we did that conference. And I started off with my usual rant, and somebody, I think it was the UCU rep, it said, it's all very well you saying that, Bob, but uh, there's no money. And I turned to Peter, who's a great friend of mine, and I said, Peter, how many buildings has Leeds City College got? And he turned to his vice principal and he said, uh, Dave, how many buildings have we got? And Dave turned to the head of estates and said, Stuart, how, how many buildings have we got? And to reinforce that point, that same summer, my mum was dying in Rochdale and I live in Urmston. So I was driving from Manchester to, um, to, to Rochdale every day. So the way from here is I would drive past Trafford College, just down the road here. I would go past Hopwood Hall College, which is the old De La Salle buildings, you know, on the old teacher training college in Middleton. Then I'd drive past uh, Rochdale Sixth Form College seven stories built 26 million pounds under the building skills of the future and right next to it was hotwood hall uh, original rochdale tech college now from june july august and september every day all those buildings were empty nobody in them not being used and even on the days when the term time was on and i drove past if you got past five o'clock at night, they were still empty. Now, please don't tell me, don't throw back at me.
we can't afford to invest in our workers, our workforce to improve their skills. Please don't tell me we can't afford to invest in putting a good Wi-Fi over the campus and everything like that. When at the moment, the assets are trapped in an old model of pedagogy that is now no longer fit for purpose. And I'm not saying for one minute, sell off all your land and buildings and everything goes online. I've never said that. People like that Daisy Crystal will do. She's, she's got a book out called Tech Versus Teachers. How misleading is that? It's never been Tech Versus Teachers. It's Tech Plus Teachers. And what I'm saying is that the model, the current model that we've got is not fit for purpose and we need to remodel, reshape. And what COVID does, what COVID is doing, is allowing us to do, it's, it, instead of me doing a little bit of a nudge here and a nudge there and everything like that, it's blown the whole thing up. It said, look, it can happen, but we need to invest significantly. We need to have leadership. We need to have vision. We need to have an infrastructure. We need to have a workforce that's got the confidence and the capability. Now, there are, you know, people are trying hard. There's College of Teachers, Cat Scott's doing a lot of work. There's a lot of little videos and everything like that. It's a bit constrained by the DFE's view of what EdTech is. Uh, Vicky Lozier at the ETF, there's loads of stuff going on like UFI, where I was a trustee until last week, we're putting five million pounds a year into f funding projects. And in fact, we've just set up a fund for, to help with COVID as well. So, you know, there's lots of stuff going on, but we have no system leadership. Yeah, 100 yeah. percent. And I think for me personally, I, I'm, I'm in a position uh, like like Ben and Steve, where I'm kind of I'm leading uh, my my school um, in terms of getting online and, and been doing that for a few years and and like like you said it early on in the podcast that's just accelerated a hundredfold over the last couple of weeks and and I'm starting to wonder what when we go back how do we stop it going back to normal how do we how do we make sure yeah. that this continues and I'm I'm starting to anticipate the questions I'm starting to formulate my answers almost um just just trying to trying to get my head around it as well and 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 what's the most persuasive way to to make sure that we continue with these tools and there's so there's so much there's so much out there but it keeps coming back to Bob keeps coming back to exams especially in in the secondary school yeah. setting where I am where I'm at and is that the is this the big elephant in the room at the moment and I'm just going to put something up that Al Kingsley um posted just before um he's yeah it's is this the elephant in the room that we need to tackle now in order to, to keep yeah, yeah. this going? Could you just maybe touch on that a bit? Thank you. Yeah, I, 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 I absolutely, you're absolutely right. To, to, the things that really drive the system, I mean, you've heard me say this many times before, that, that, that the, the assessment system is the tail that wags the pedagogical dog, doesn't it? And until we do something about that, uh, then, you know, it's really difficult. And, and what I would say is this. Uh, I spoke at the e-assessment award dinners last year, and I've been a, a judge of theirs for, for three years. The, you, you talk to their members, and they will tell you they're doing some fantastic things. Listen, I, 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 we shortlisted three. I won't, I'm not going to give you the names or anything like that. But there is one country that's currently part of the United Kingdom that's just moved to a completely online formative assessment for key stage three and four. Completely online now it's taken them three years and it's cost them a lot of money and they had a lot of resistance and everything like that there are lots of private companies who are doing lots of assessment that's completely virtual and completely online but at the moment the, the qualifications and the, the awarding of bodies that they'll dispute this you know if they're listening to this now they go oh no bob's wrong and everything like that we'll, we'll we're really helping and supporting. But if you talk to the people in that e-assessment industry, they'll tell you that the off-qual are, are unhelpful, are obstructive, and could do an awful lot more to help them innovate in this space. Let, let me share a personal anecdote with you, will you please? Let me, Don, Donald Clark's a good friend of mine, and he, know, he knows me very well. Let, and, and he's right. We've got to shift the exam culture in the long term. Let me share this personal anecdote with you. Uh, Emily uh, has got uh, Asperger's, 
And uh, he's a lovely young man, and he's taught me such a lot in the last few years. And uh, uh, I've learned an awful lot from him. And uh, he went to a university. He got he went through school, got his A levels, went to university, and he got the dis the, the student uh, uh, a disabled student pack, which ironically to Sheba were were part supplying. So he got a, a laptop and uh, recording systems and audio software and text to voice. Da, 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 da. So for three years, he worked on screens, on tablets, on laptops, uh, on keyboards and everything like that. When he came to do his assessment, he had to sit in a room and write for three hours on an A4 pen with an A4 paper with pen. Now, that's like learning to drive in a Formula One car and riding a horse for your test, isn't it? Yeah. It's just, just nonsense and everything like that. And Donald Clark is absolutely right. And he's probably forgotten more about online learning and assessment than I've than I know, but he's absolutely right. The, 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 the vested interest in the status quo is what hopefully COVID will allow us to smash to one side. It'll be difficult and we mustn't allow it to go back and bet Dan, you, you know, the one thing that you, th you, you're talking about legacy. And even though, you know, Ben might be bolder than me, he's a lot younger than me. And the great thing for me, and I, and, and I mean this, this is absolutely sincere. The, the great thing for me looking at this screen now is, you know, I, I'm 70. You know, if COVID doesn't get me, something will at some point in time. But you know what's really important for me is that somewhere along the line, I've inspired you three guys to do what you're doing now. Now, that's legacy. That, that, that's, that's legacy. And there are people there that have listened to me and laughed with me and heard me sick jokes and uh, but said, you know, but he's got a real point, you know, me Ken Loach stuff and everything like that. Now, this is not going to be over. I, I mean, I was really pissed off yesterday because the AOC put a, 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 a newsletter article. I don't know who wrote it, but it says, so now the sprint to online learning, now the sprint to online learning is over. What? <laughs> this, we have, we've just, we're, we're on the first mile of a marathon here now. This is not the sprints over, you know, just because you've opened up a few Zoom sessions, put a PowerPoint online, you know, and uh, done a podcast. That's not that's not. So, you, you know, the assessment system is a massive drag and we've got to. And I, I have to say there are people in the assessment association winning massive con around the world to do countries online, New Zealand, Australia, India doing lots of stuff and we're lagging behind and the reason we're lagging behind is we don't have the political vision we've got the pedagogical prejudice of nick gibb and some of his uh, you know uh, missionaries who are well paid by the way if you get on the gravy train uh, and somehow we now now that gene is out of the bottle we can't let them come back in so i'm i'm, I'm absolutely delighted that you and there's an army of you you know, there's however many thousand followers I've got on Twitter with me. A lot of people don't. But you're you're the future. You, I, I need you. Because, you know, I, I can't be getting up at half past six in the morning to get on a train to London to speak at a conference for very much longer. I'll do it from my armchair like this now. But, you know, it's up to you. And I, I need you and the next generation of people to pick up the torch and carry on this message. Because I'll tell you what, guys, history will prove us right. Yeah, and, and, and I think our journey started uh, a long time ago, Bob. Um, I think I was just moved from a from a PE teacher in terms of a advanced practitioner and moving, and and before I even got involved uh, in the in the edtech stuff. And I think it's that inspiration, and and not we talk about aspirations and raising aspirations of of, of students. How about raising aspirations of us as teachers, but also yeah, never yeah, yeah. forgetting that the reason why we do this. And I know there's people who are worried in terms of using ed tech and all that kind of stuff let's put professional development let's support them but let's not lose sight of it's about look past yourself it's about the students that we service and if one member of staff doesn't do it in an organization that could be 20 30 40 kids that we are doing a disservice to in terms of the support and actually what they could achieve not about an exam not about a qualification actually about inspiring them to want to learn be passionate about their subject and be passionate about learning and 
yes, exams need changing, but actually we need to change a mechanism where it's actually inspiring people to be passionate about learning, whatever mechanism we can use. So they want to extend their learning beyond the four walls of a building. And ed, and ed tech, there is no other way to do it other than ed tech. You can send paper work packs home all you want, but actually, how do you know that that's happening? How do you support that? And this has proven this period that technology is the best way and the only way to do that. And we need to inspire other people and we need to come together and kind of build the revolution that we talk about as edgy futurists all the time, raise each other up and not be downtrodden after this. Um, maybe I'm getting on my soapbox, I'm getting a bit emotional, but no, I think see. we need to continue and going <laughs> forward. I think, I think let's not be put back in this box. Let's, let's not be the last book on the shelf. Let's, let's stand forward and let's say, you know what, you're wrong and, and be confident enough Ooh. to say, you know what, you're wrong, and this is what the students are saying. Ask your students, because that's not what we're doing. Let's think, ask other teachers and ask other people. Ask your students, and, and let's not say no. Steve, Steve, I don't think it's anything wrong with getting passionate about that and standing on that soapbox. I think it's the exact right soapbox to be stood on. Um, we're, 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 all on the, we're on the same page, aren't we? I don't know if you remember a few months ago, talking into that e-assessment stuff and talking back round all that stuff around... Um, the, the 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 genie's out of the lamp or the bottle genie out of the bottle i don't know Caf uh, christine aguilera somewhere talked about just, just to go on to that have you been watching disney plus there ben <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, I i spoke for uh, btl up at their um surpass conference and talked about this um this being this closed loop around uh it feels like everything's done online to a certain extent but not not gone the full hog i think the I had a conversation with um with a guy from one of the exam boards um who will remain nameless uh and he, he he basically came to us at the end and said um I think it's our fault isn't it the reason why we're not moving is the exam boards and I think it, it is to an extent uh, if, unless they're prepared to change and I don't know how many of them are listening um uh, and and hopefully th they'll hear this that there are people that are saying this endpoint assessment this summative sat in a room with and we haven't even really gone about formative stuff but they sat in a room with a pen and a piece of paper in that traditional way um it, we don't live in that world anymore that we we've got to we've got to think about this very very differently and i think this is uh this is the the kind of the thing that we're really passionate about it's not just about get let's scrap exams but this present situation has proved to us that exams are not they're not fit for purpose because we've acknowledged that we're not going to do um, endpoint assessment exams and they're not going to be how we're going to make a decision about a student's future. So if we're doing it now, then why not do it long term? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't have a great deal of sympathy for Nick Gibb. Uh, in fact, I've got none at all because I think he's, he personally has been the greatest blockage to development. Center. But I, I, I have a, a tad of sympathy for him at the moment. Uh, because he must be going having sleepless nights because the two things that he's resisted completely has been teacher-based assessments and the use of technology for teaching and learning, and both of which, because of COVID-19, are now going to happen and happen big time. So uh, it'll be interesting to see how brave uh, the government are uh, because there is no going back. There's no going back. The, the, the momentum that there is behind us um, and, uh, the, the, you know, the growing, uh, not just here in this country, as Doc Clark says, uh, you know, across the world, uh, we can't let him, let, you know, hold us back. We've got to push on. We've got to push on. And I think it's it's at that point we, we start to talk about, we've, we've delved into it and we've gone past and present and, and starting to look at the future then. Um, and I know we've said we don't want it to revert back and we want it to push forward and continue, but I don't know in the chats and, and the comments as people, what do we think and what do you think, Bob, does the future of education look like or what should it look like in, in your view and, and, and everybody else's? Well, I'll, 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 I'll tell you what it shouldn't look like. It shouldn't look like what it looks like now. Uh, you know, it, it's, got, it's got to look differently. And at, at this point in my presentations, uh, Steve, you, you'll... I probably would flash up my picture of my grandchildren. Uh, I've got seven with another one on the way in June and their age range is from 13, well, obviously through to one that's born in June. So work that out when they'll be leaving schools. Uh, the 13-year-old will be leaving school in five years, so that's 2025. And the one that's about to be born 
add uh, 18 years on to where we are now, that would take us to what, 2038. Now, think about that. Think about the changes in the, your use of, I mean, think about what we are doing now. We wouldn't have been doing this 12 months ago. A video conference with four people, four educators, transmitting to a load of other people out there. With it, it, it was so. Think about what's happened in 12 months forward to 2038. So I, I, it's difficult to predict. And and I, if I put my uh, commercial hat on for the years that I worked with Toshiba. Uh, I never sold a device, by the way. Uh, I never sold anything. I was they didn't employ me for doing that. But the way that capitalism works is the devices that you're currently using and buying in schools are already out of date. Believe me, the replacement devices are already developed, tested, and some of them, if I'm honest, are already in containers in the Osaka and elsewhere around in Taiwan and around there ready to be shipped but you've got to buy the old shit first all right until you've bought all the old shit they won't be shipping the new shit so what 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 think about the things on the horizon and, and Donald Clark who's listening to this if you want to get a chance to listen to him talk about artificial intelligence artificial intelligence and what that's going to do listen to his podcast uh, go and look at Donald Cat Clark uh, blogs uh, Donald Clark plan B just search for it on Google it's got it does the artificial intelligence is going to be massive and have a massive impact but my guess is that my grandchildren will leave schools which will be completely different to the way that they are today and this has got implications for colleges because if the schools are going to be different the colleges will have to be different because otherwise the kids won't come there will they unless they're relevant and they've got so you know I think they will be full of screens They'll be full of young people who are used to accessing learning as and when they want, where they want. They'll, they'll, they'll be probably paperless. There'll be touch screen. There'll be voice to text technology, text to voice technology. There'll be virtual reality. There'll be uh, 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 audio and visual uh, stimulation. I don't think they'll have lines of desks. I think libraries will be completely different. I think assessment hopefully will be completely different. So the key question is, what what do we as educators, what does the system have to do to adapt and evolve in an agile way to be able to cope with what uh, what what they are going what they what they are going to expect? Because if they don't get what they were expecting, they're not going to come, are they? True. True, and I think the the comment that's on screen now from uh, Phil, Phil, I think you used to work with Philip at, uh, at Northern. Um, yeah, that yeah, that yeah. that element of you talking about the physical estate is going to change. Um, wh yeah. what, what 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 do you think that looks like? I know Steve's gone to changing a lot of his library space to be around independent learning zones and about there yeah, being yeah, yeah, and yeah. not being as many physical books in that way because obviously a lot of things can be electronic. It, do you think? Do you think that is? Um, do you think we'll have as many buildings? Do you think we'll need as many buildings? Well, can you possibly justify uh, that physical estate that we've currently got, which is el empty, empty for huge chunks of the year and the day and the night? Can Can you really justify that? I, I don't think you can. Uh, my view is. We can have twice as many learners and half as many buildings. There you go. How about that for a sound bite? Twice as many learners, half as many builders. Do you know there are institutions, one in this country, world famous, open university. Of course, it's got buildings, but it's buildings for their uh, admin staff and the support staff and everything like that. And they do have some face to face in the summer schools. There's other universities across the world. Donald Clark will tell you some of them. Athabasca University in Canada. It's got no buildings. It's all virtual. Thousands of students every year. University of Phoenix in Arizona. Now, I'm not suggesting for one minute, I'm not getting into the Daisy Crystal or whatever she's called uh, argument. I'm not going to say it's tech versus teachers. It's not. It's technology plus teachers plus students 
plus buildings where they're needed. But let me ask you this. From your experience as teachers, is it absolutely necessary to have that group of people of that cohort together at that moment in time to do what you want to do with them in terms of learning? And I would suggest that we can deliver lots of learning in a better way and certainly lots of assessment in a better way. Just, just on the assessment thing, let me give you an example. One of the entrants for the e-assessment award for formative assessments this year got shortlisted. I'm not going to tell you whether it's one or not. But it's in FE, Stephen, and it's about the assessment of English and maths when students come to you, the first, first of all, all right? At the moment, at the moment, uh, paper based assessments for on for English and maths usually taking in between an hour and an hour and a half. It's a system that can do it all in 20 minutes. And they don't necessarily need the people to be in the room or with the teacher supervising. It can be all done remotely and then they can start right from we, we know where you are. This is what this is what we think your journey should be. So you, your question is. Will we need as many land and buildings? Answers no. Need a, a better, robust uh, digital infrastructure? Answer yes. For example, I, I'm on BT Open Zone, and it, my my Wi-Fi is shit at the moment, and that's probably why I'm a bit delayed on all this. So, will we need robust industrial strength infrastructure? Because, believe me, teachers, if they think it's going to fall over, they ain't going to use it. You know, we'll be back to flip charts and stuff like that, which are appropriate sometimes, but, you know, not if we're moving forward. So we'll need less buildings, a better skilled workforce, which has got more capacity, more capability to deliver and support learning wherever it takes place, and an assessment system that can use technology to do all that. Uh, but in order to get that, we need a paradigm shift in terms of the vision and the leadership for the sectors for both schools and colleges. Now, there are different constraints. Obviously, schools with the younger kids, you've got lots of safety and uh, safeguarding restraints and everything like that. We still have with all this with our our adult students as well. But it, it doesn't. It's not either or. It's not one or the other. And when people start talking about it's either tech or teachers, it's never been that. It's not that at all. That's just being that's just being stupid. It's about how teachers can use technology to support learning whenever, wherever, uh, and in the best possible way. Yeah, hundred um, percent. Just for everyone who's watching live, if you've got any uh, questions for Bob that haven't been answered yet, uh, get them in now, and we can spend a bit of time at the end asking them uh, if needs be. Uh, Bob, just just to build on what you were just saying there, is it does it is this going to have to be a full top down approach here from government? Or, or, or is it going to have no, to be? No, 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 no. Okay. No, no, so, no. Listen. Yeah. You, you, you've some of you have seen a graph that I've put. You know, the last thing we need to do is wait for the government, for Christ's sake, because uh, you know yeah. it, it took them two years. It took them two. It took them two years to come out with that ed tech strategy, and I could have written something better in five minutes on the back of a fag packet. Uh, <laughs> no, no, no. No, no, my question is just before you go further. I know the the grassroots stuff, and it and it, and we're seeing the grassroots yeah. stuff grow a lot in the last few weeks, a lot. But we've had a, we've yeah. had quite a few comments coming in saying that a lot of the ed tech specialists in schools are exhausted. They they they're sick of swimming against the tide. Um, does 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 the top down approach and the bottom up approach need to join in the middle here, or is it completely absolutely. a grassroots thing? Yeah. No, absolutely, absolutely. I, you're absolutely right, Dan. That's spot on. When I'm when I'm asked to work with a college or a school, you you know people will ring me up and say, "Oh, will you come and we want you to do?" So we're thinking about doing going on a digital journey. Will you come and speak to the staff? Well, yeah, but you know, what else are you going to do? Oh, well, we haven't thought that. No, no, no. If people want me to come and work with them, and I'm just about you know, even though I'm last late, I'm prepared to do it. But they have to give me an assurance right from the word go. One is that I can work with the governors. That's my starting point. And the second one is I can work with the learners. And if I can work with the governors and I can work with the learners, I can slowly squeeze the middle. With government, 
government are too slow to react. We are hidebound by the ideological and pedagogical prejudice of the schools minister for particular types of delivery and his knowledge based things. I think knowledge is important. I've, I, you know, I've been in education, you know, 50 years. I've taught for 40 years. And there's never been a lesson I've ever, ever, you know, taught of knowledge. So this, this whole idea that it's knowledge or skills is, is rubbish. Uh, but so I think you're dead, dead right, Danny. In an institution, it has to come from both. At national level, hopefully, hopefully, I had telephone calls yesterday from the Association of Colleges, the Collab Group, the Association of Learning Providers, all asking me, can we pick your brains about what I want to do now? Hopefully, the DFE will be listening and the DFE will say, you know what? We need to do something. Even if all they do is we don't we can't wait for them to deliver top down directives. That's the worst thing that can happen. But what we need to do is for them to lift, lift the blockages. Have a word with Ofsted. Have a word with Ofqual. Have a word with the skills funding agency. There are levers that, 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 that they can pull at policy level, which will free up the system. So we don't want them to. To, to, to dictate to us, because I've told you what happens with teach when you tell teachers what they have to do, they go like this. <laughs> Let me get the two fingers in there. That's what teachers do when you tell them, you know, you're going to do this. And so what we have to do is we have to engage with teachers. So bottom up, listen, d listen, don't lose heart. I, I can't afford for you. I've spent 20 years of my life. Don't let don't let me be wasted. You know, I need you lot and some more people to keep pushing up and pushing up. And I know they'll be exhausted, but there's more of us now. We can support each other. We know we've got history on our side. We have know we've got the evidence on our side. And we've got to push against, uh, you know, those blockers and stoppers that we've got. But don't, for goodness sake, wait for the DFE to intervene because it'll be... It won't work. It just won't work. That uh, that album, Ben, just before you jump in there, sorry, uh, that Oasis album and well-known quote, uh, Standing on the Shoulders of Giants, springs to mind there. Yeah. So we need as many people on Bob's shoulders as possible, I think. Yeah, 100%. And I think... Yeah. It, 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 I, I, I'm sat here and thinking to myself, you're absolutely right. Don't give up. We'll get there. We'll all push through. My my kind of take on it as somebody who who, who is trying, feeling like sometimes trying to push water uphill, uh, and and getting a a, a a fight. Um, when you get into it, and I, I'm quite up for a fight. Always have been. What what what's what's your go to? How do how do you, how do you get? I, I'm I'm a teacher. I'm a curriculum manager. I've got some level of of, of sway, but. Get into a governor level, get into a principal level, get into a, a decision maker level. How do we how do we convince those stakeholders? Um, that what, what would what would you advise there? Because I think a lot of the people that are in here are going to be on the ground, aren't they? They're going to be going to be foot soldiers, um, and we don't always have this, the same level of um, exposure to the people that make the difference. Listen, I I think you are the next people. Not not just you three, but some of the people who are listening on here. I've seen some of the names come up. You are the next assistant principal. I'll, I'll tell you, many, many years ago, uh, there was a, an NPQH candidate of mine called Paul Haig uh, in uh, Sheffield when I was doing NPQH. And he was the first one to introduce mobile phones into his uh, classroom. He got absolutely, he got absolutely uh, hammered by the Daily Mail, you know, exposing the Daily Mail, ridiculed. You know, this is what there's come to. He's now a head teacher of Sheffield's most successful school. And he's still held on to his beliefs. I hope he's going to be one of the new uh, ed tech uh, hubs that are, it depends when they get around to announcing it, the DFE, uh, you know, for the the innovator schools or whatever they're called and everything like that, under that paltry £10 million expenditure. Un under no circumstances must you give up. You are the next generation. Let me tell you, the next level of assistant principals, assistant heads, vice principals in FE colleges and in schools will definitely have digital technology on the job descriptions. They, they, they've got to. It's got it's this. This is a paradigm shift. This is a system shift. And uh, it's got to happen. And I know the DFE, I know the new FE and skills minister and uh, hopefully 
uh, once Nick Gibb uh, moves on, we'll get somebody. Uh, I'm not sure about Gavin Williamson. I'm not sure he quite gets it. Uh, but we, we, we absolutely need to build on this paradigm shift. We can't let it to go back. And you are the people to do it. And the people who are listening and the people that follow on Twitter, and the people that go to the conferences, uh, build your network. I mean, for example, uh, how many of you are members of NACE? Join NACE. If you're an FAE, you join the Association of Learning Technology. Uh, there are lots of uh, associations and organizations. And I, I'm really gl glad he's prompted me. Uh, Donald Clark has, has just mentioned, absolutely critical, absolutely critical. Uh, teacher training has to change, massively has to change. And there are some people out there who want to change it. There's an organization called the TPEA, the Technology Pedagogical Education Association, full of people from the uh, teacher training institutions. But because the system is so fragmented now, the teacher training system, it's difficult to get a policy right the way across the board. I, I, I uh, introduced uh, a digital bit onto the NPQH all those years ago. And uh, if you can do it at a system level, but of course this government have fragmented everything. You know, it's all academy chains and free schools. It's different to bring about systemic change. But teacher training is a massive issue. And there are people out there and there are institutions uh, in, in FE, uh, David Powell at Uddersfield's doing some really good stuff. Wolverhampton University doing some good stuff in, in, in schools, Chester University, uh, um, the one out near uh, Pad, uh, Warrington here. What's it called? Uh, oh, uh, this is what happens when you get to 70, start forgetting things. Uh, uh, you know, the teacher training. There's lots of them that are, that are trying to. Do it. However, however, the really sad thing is. The government advisory group on initial teacher education, chaired by Sam Twizzleton, hasn't mentioned digital skills and digital technology in, in the uh, the current standards for teachers. That's ridiculous because they are driven by the requests of, and the requirements of Nick Gibb. Nick Gibb puts these people onto the various committees and they've told the line. So we must push back. We've got to push back. Yeah, and 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 we've talked about it and professional development, lifting each other up and and, and sharing. Um, I think we're all big big believers. Obviously, Dan, um, Ben, and, and and Bob, and everybody else probably on this call. I think it's time to to share best practice, to 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 magpie. And I know some HE people say, "What steal ever?" I no, no. When people actually want to give it, let them take their ideas, not reinvent the wheel, but let's let's open the channel of communication. Whether when that when the colleges open up again. Um, let face to face whatever the lot looks like share with each other communicate with each other build your personal learning network and be open to somebody take your opportunities take a voluntary role as a as a chair of governors or a governor infiltrate or or, or job be a position where you can actually make decisions and then there'll be go to people they say well actually look what's happening here and actually use an example of somebody else that you know in your personal learning network there's people out there um, that have been doing it for years let's raise each other up and let's let's make sure that we engage in a personal learning network where if something isn't happening let's not just say okay okay let's take your point of view let's go to somebody else that might be doing it let's see what they're doing and see whether you can send that back to then say you know what actually we can do it because look what they're doing it's free Ooh. i think i think we're not manchester city and manchester united we're not competing for the title of necessarily best education organization in the world even though we're some, we've got an opportunity in our league tables are off the cards for the next two years to then say, actually, we're doing it for the benefit of the staff and the students. We're going to learn from each other. We're not going to compete. And let's raise up the standards and, and, and start to push that forward. Let's not be working in silos. Education as a whole um, needs to change and let's do it together. Maybe I've just rambled. I agree. And everybody's, everybody's I agree. Everybody's just saying, you know what, we're no. bored, we're done now. But I, I think it's no, no, You're right, Steve. You're right, Steve. Yeah, you are. Yeah. We we at the summit that we did last year, um, we 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 talked about this, and we, it was about joining the revolution and the the fist pump and and, and getting with it, and and that's all emotional hype. I think deep, and I know when I'm like I'm an emotional hype person, and I think sometimes it's the what's the action that we do after this, and I think we've all we've all talked about that. Steve, you mentioned a few things there about collaboration, uh, about working together. That message has just come up from Caroline about not being competitive and that we shouldn't see this as a as as, as beating each other or, or we should all it's that rising tide lifts all ships 
Um, and we've got we've got we've got a responsibility to work together. Um, there was a phrase that was used earlier. I know one of the comments that talks about like a joined up thinking between primary, secondary, and tertiary education. That needs some some work as well. That concept of thinking about um, this is not just about the the one key stage passing that and then not forgetting about what happens going forward it's that personalization it's about working together and and and, and thinking about the joined up processes and i hate that phrase it's cheesy as anything but there is there is, there's got to be some thinking that is joined up in there yeah how do we do that though because uh, 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 sorry bob it just i'm just thinking everyone's going to go back to normal there's going to be pockets going on um little communities going on around the country there's no there, there isn't a whole lot of joined up national um, f- grassroots strategies going on at the moment. There are, there are lots of pockets of things going on. We can't wait for the government because it, it's going to take them five years before they they realise the COVID pandemic's over. So it's it's what do we do in that in that interim time? In that time, as soon as we get back for the next twelve months, why why league tables like Steve was saying, why league tables aren't as important. How do we how do we group together? How do we how do we make sure the grassroots somebody in a school in Devon who doesn't have any um, PLN is is linking with a similar school in the northeast of England who's 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 pushing ahead here and can support each other? I think that's a big question uh, that needs to be answered. Really. Well, what what one of the uh, there, there are organisations like NACE N A A C E which are free to join. They got a, a that's one. In FE, there's ALT, Association of Learning Technologies and everything like that. And, and hopefully, uh, what, I, what I hope will come out of the Ed Tech Hub initiative, you know, the Ed, you know at the moment, the, the, uh, the government put £10 million into this Ed Tech strategy, and one of the ideas is that, they're at, that, that they have hubs in schools. Yeah. We have, they, haven't yet got it, they haven't got it for FE yet, but hopefully we might be able to persuade them to do that. Now, what, what I'm trying to do is to persuade uh, 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 the people who were responsible for the EdTech Hub strategy in schools to say, listen, when we started off doing this, it was under our existing EdTech strategy. But if, if we could invest instead of 10 million, 100 million in that, then there's no reason why we couldn't have uh, build up the expertise in, let's say, 100 schools instead of just 10 schools to say how can they share how can they uh, collaborate how can they help each other so your school in devon might be helped by a neighbor school further down the road but that takes time it takes resources it takes investment but most of all more than any of that it takes vision yeah. and uh, hopefully I, i'm hopeful uh, yeah i had some communications yesterday which suggest that the dfe not the EdTech strategy people, but the DFE much higher up are starting to get a bit worried about this shift that's gone on that they've not controlled, they've not had any uh, control over, and what can they do to respond? Because, you know, the online blended virtual learning... uh, Oh, here's another one. How about working from home? Genie is out of the bottle. So, you know, what what I think... what, what. what, what I think we need to do is try and persuade them, put pressure on them through our various sources. I'll be doing it in a, a TES article, hopefully, a TES FE article that will hopefully appear within the next couple of days, uh, and through my various other channels, try and put the pressure on. Because I think they have the skeleton there, even though I disagree with the remit that they gave the hubs. It's not about promoting services or products or... Microsoft or Google, it's about pedagogy. Uh, and, uh, you know, if they can build on that and build a national net. But you know what What really pisses me off with all this? We've wasted 10 years. We, we, we had all this. We had, we had a national agency, Vector. We had a national strategy called the e-learning strategy called Harnessing Technology. We had a national funding mechanism which, you know, gave money for ICT when Jim Knight was the school minister. We had, uh, you know, national organisations like NACE uh, to support teachers. And we had a national scheme called Building Schools for the Future that's going to spend £4.5 billion on ICT. 
the really sad thing for me is we could have been in a much better place, but we are where we are. So, you know, we need to support each other. We need to create networks. We need to share. You need to keep doing things like this. I need to keep writing articles that will embarrass the government, hopefully, and push them into doing something and do podcasts. Twitter, Twitter is the best free CPD I've ever had in my life. I mean, why wouldn't you want to learn and share and, you know, I mean, I, 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 don't put, I don't put any of the crap, you know, about what you had for breakfast or coffee or anything like that. But in terms of a, in terms of a, a, a you know, a professional sharing network and everything like that, uh, it's been absolutely fantastic. I've learned a tremendous amount, even from people that I don't agree with. Uh, but, you know, I've, le- I've learned a, a tremendous amount. So I, I think there is a fantastic opportunity. You mentioned the accountability system is shot, isn't it now? So what a great opportunity it is for us to try, you know, we've got an opportunity to try and do things in a different way and explore. And somehow let's try and move schools and colleges away from that bottom end of just exchanging old technology for new technology, whiteboards or uh, projectors, right the way to be how to empower students to use the digital uh, their own digital skills and their own digital equipment so that they can access learning and we can support that learning and let's keep pushing back against the assessment system keep pushing back against the inspection system keep pushing back about the uh, funding system to make it support it i think we haven't got a choice have we and, and I, i'm I, you know that you've heard this last line Stephen, before but i'm going to give it to you because i think we're, we're about running out of energy now aren't we uh, <laughs> Well, well, I, well, I, I am anyway, because uh, even though my wife just brought me a cup of tea, listen, th- th- that picture. And normally, when I say this, I have the picture of my grandkids in front of me, and you know, I love them to bits. Uh, there's absolutely no doubt that uh, your future, our future, the country's future, is in their heads, right? But their future is in the schools and colleges hands we can't afford to let them down guys can't afford to let them down no and um i'm kind of i'm i'm doing this more for bob you know he said he's 70 and then he's running out of energy i don't know whether he's got a monster in that cup uh, rather than a, and a coffee <laughs> and everything else but um steve do you want to tell people <laughs> But in case people don't know what a monster is and think he's a- oh yeah well yeah if, if you haven't had a monster it's it's the thing that the students drink before they come to to, to you guys on a morning regardless of your education to keep them awake for for the, some of the the dross that we deliver including that's why I'm no longer a teacher because I think the Leeds City College saw that I couldn't teach anymore anyway um, so I think to sum up there's loads of different stuff out there and I know that I've I've, I've said it and I'll say it a million times. Ment- mentoring is so important. We need to look outside. Just, education hang on, hang well. on. I, oh. I just say hello to my wife. Will you? <laughs> she just brought. She just, hello. She's just brought me the brew. Brilliant. Right, that's, that's it. Brilliant. I'm, so I've um, sent her off to do the washing now. I'm joking. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> so I, I, I think mentoring is so important, and and I know the services out there and everything else, but. What we need to do is open our doors and, and say, you know what? Um, if you're on Twitter, absolutely brilliant. For those people who are not on Twitter, maybe creating a mechanism and a, a kind of go-to place um, through the Edge of Futurists or wherever, we're, we're happy to host it in regards to networks and organisations that will support that people to go to that will will share best practice. And that bit of you're not alone, there's other people out there. Come and see what other people are doing. Have those conversations. And I'm, I'm, I'll gladly put that out there now. Uh, work will probably kill me. But I, anybody that wants to come and have conversations or do it over Twitter or or anything else about this, I will gladly do that um, any time of day. Yeah. 100%. Because without that mentoring, you're only going to get the same voices. You're only going to hear from the same people. And I, and I think that's including the students. And I know that um, Donald talked about it earlier in terms of the parents, working with all stakeholders, listening to everybody, listening to each other and, and celebrating what we're doing. The culture has to change in terms of home working, the trust mechanism that just because you haven't got an outcome to then say, well, actually, how can you prove this works? Well, let's trust. 
and let's give it a good go, the fact that everything has a, a correlation. It can't be a causal effect. That if we don't give it a go now, and we always stick with what we, we're doing, nothing will change. And we need to be strong enough to then say, this pencil will not show you a, a causal link to outcomes, but actually technology and trusting staff that they are doing their best and they're giving it a good go will open us up to something that we've never done before. Trust across all lines and all mechanisms in terms of all stakeholders is important as well. Yeah, yeah well, one, one of my school presentations, uh, Stephen, uh, you've probably not seen it because I do it for schools, is, uh, is entitled, Will Investment in ICT Improve My Learning Outcomes? Is the wrong question. It's the wrong question. You know, the question is, what is the opportunity cost of me not preparing my learners for a to be digital citizens and, dig and a digital future? That's the question. Yeah. 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 And, and, and at that point, I think this is the longest, is it, guys, that, that we've, we've done yeah. in terms of a guest? Close to an so, hour yeah. and a half. Absolutely brilliant, Bob. Uh, and I'm going to kind of leave it with a quote from a guest that we've had in terms of Rob Hoban, uh, when some people asked him, and Rob Hoban, um, if you, if what what number is the podcast, and what is the title of that, Dan? You're the or, or Ben? I'll find it for you. I'll find it for you now. But what Rob said when he was questioned, that Agora School are doing some amazing stuff. If if go search it um, in in Holland in terms of on the internet. But what he said is. Aren't you worried the risk that you're taking with these the, the 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 future of these kids? And he said, "Aren't you worried that you're taking a bigger risk, by by, yeah, do, by doing exactly the same as what you've always done?" And I think that's Episode what we need 17. to think about. Go go have a listen to that and 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 have a watch back and 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 we'll be posting this everywhere because Bob, this has been absolutely amazing. Yeah. It's been brilliant to have you on and and to everybody else that's engaged. I'm and, grateful. And questions. Um, I'm so fantastic. grateful. I'm so grateful for you giving me a voice. Um, I, I, I am really grateful, and, and I, I, you, you know, you're my legacy, and the other people who come along, and it inspires me to listen to see you doing what you're doing and everything like that. And and you know, uh, okay, yes, I am 70, uh, and I'm more than willing to come out and help organisations do this, but not if you're not serious. Don't don't be saying come and do half an hour. At, at, if you want me to come out and help your school or your college, if we're, I'm more than happy to do it as long as you're serious about it and it's going to have some impact but otherwise but you know guys carry on keep going keep pushing don't be disheartened and uh history as donald said history has already proved us right yeah 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 yeah. Well, yeah. Well, uh, yeah. Absolutely, yeah absolutely brilliant thank you bob thank you everybody yeah. can i just Thanks. say as well I, okay. uh, you're welcome i cut my own hair the other day and nobody said anything so i'm guessing it's pretty good. Have, have you shared it off? <laughs> oh, no, no, that's just receding airline, Dan. <laughs> how, the club. Ben, how far has yours receded? Uh, it's, it's, it's on my back. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not turning around. You don't, you don't want to see the back. Uh, yeah. Thanks, Bob. Bob, yeah. it's yeah. been a pleasure. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. All the best. All the best. You, you're going to lock me out. 